Mary, full of grace and daughters with thee, blessed art thou among women, 
and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Please be seated. A few announcements for everyone. First off, today is Angel Sunday, and uh, as such, we will have the blessing of children at the altar rail after the Mass. So, next Sunday is our annual parish picnic, and I, uh, sign up sheets are in the back vestibule. Well, there's two sheets one for, to sign up for, for, for you or your family to, to attend, to, so we know how many people plan to come. And also uh, another one that if you would like to bring something along for the, um, for the picnic, you can sign up for that. It seems that we hopefully will have good weather next weekend, and it's always a good time had. So I do hope that you are able to join us next week. And next Friday and Saturday are the first Fridays and Saturday of October, respectfully. And... Um, and as such, we have our normal first Friday and first Saturday devotions and schedule as uh, is listed out in the bulletin. And lastly, the blessing of religious articles will take place after both of the Masses next Sunday. Their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the 8th century, in northwestern France, there was a good and holy bishop who took over that uh, territory uh, and found himself to begin to, to found himself in the, that time frame having the fortune of experiencing the fruits of a newfound Christendom there. Most of the people at this point had converted to embrace the faith. There were still pagans that were about, but they were largely relegated to pockets in certain spaces where they existed. They didn't treat the Christians cruelly. In fact, they were vastly outnumbered by them. And so they were kept relatively to themselves and lived amongst themselves. And so there existed this basic peace in that area which Saint Aubert, that holy and good bishop, where he was in charge. However, this was a peace that was about to be interrupted for the good bishop, not a peace interrupted by some sort of skirmish or war, but a peace interrupted in an instance in his sleep. At once, one night, Saint Aubert was awoken from a deep, from a deep sleep. And when he opened his eyes, he saw there at the foot of his bed, St. Michael the Archangel standing before him. As he looked upon him, St. Michael delivered a message to him. He told him that off, just off the coast, there was an island known as Mont Tom. And that island, God desired it to become a place for a chapel to be built. And that the people who lived on the island, they themselves were all pagans that were there. So that he, he was instructed by St. Michael that he needed to go and he needed to talk to that small group of pagan sheep farmers and tell them that they must <coughs> either convert to the faith, instruct them and then give them the opportunity to convert. And if they are not interested in converting, that they must leave the island and go somewhere else because this island now belonged to the Lord and they are not, and it's meant to be a sanctuary for Christians. Saint, and with that, the Saint Michael disappeared. Saint Aubert, now finding his room empty, marveled at what he had just witnessed, the great privilege that was afforded to him. But what he had heard as a message seemed a bit of a difficult task and it required him to sort of upset the happy balance that they had struck in the area. He began to question if he had actually seen what he actually did indeed see. 
You began to think, perhaps it was a really vivid and realistic dream. And then he convinced himself of this reality, thinking about how that region of France was known for its strong uh, cheeses, and that he had eaten that with a lot of muscles the evening before. And he thought perhaps the combination of the two was playing tricks on his mind, and it caused him to have this very vivid dream of St. Michael. And so soon, he forgot the message that was brought to him. Well, as time passed by, again, he had gone to bed another night, and again he was woken up with a start. And once again, found St. Michael there standing at the foot of his bed. The same message is delivered to him. The same instructions about what to do with the inhabitants of that small little island and how it is meant to be turned into a place where there was the church to be built at its top. Now, St. Aubert knew it wasn't the food that caused a hallucination. Now he knew, for sure, he had seen with his own eyes St. Michael standing at the foot of his bed. And he made ready to follow through with the instructions of the angel. But then, as it would be, Saint Aubert began to overthink what had happened that night before. He overthought it to the point he began to have scruples about it. He thought to himself, perhaps it wasn't an angel that I saw in reality. Saint Michael wasn't him, maybe. What if it was a devil? What if it was a trick to get me to do something that isn't God's will? What, is, what if God actually doesn't want this peace that we have here upset and this would cause more harm than good? How do I know that it actually came from heaven? The more he thought about these things, the more and more he began to question whether it was a good vision or a temptation that he had seen. But he was unable to settle it for himself and so he decided that he was going to pray and to fast for clarity on the answer. This, of course, is a very good way to proceed. But as can be the case, Saint Aubert never really much acted upon the, the, never ever came to a conclusion in his part of prayer and fasting. I don't know if he was waiting for a, a note to float down or for another vision to take place or for God himself to speak to him. But whatever it was, St. Aubert prayed and fasted, and, but in the end he did nothing in either direction, never making up his mind. And finally, a long period of time passed with no action taken and he was awoken from a dream, from sleep, a third time. And a third time, St. Michael stood at the edge of his bed. But now, instead of looking upon him kindly, the great archangel glared at him with angry eyes. And he said nothing as St. Aubert looked on fearful at the, the heavenly creature. And then St. Michael reached out without saying a word and took his finger and pressed it upon his head and pushed down upon the head of St. Aubert. He opened his mouth to protest and to promise, but at the moment that the finger touched his head, he could do nothing but cry out in pain at what he experienced. And with that, the angel withdrew his finger and then went away. St. Michael, uh, St. Aubert now for sure knew that this was indeed St. Michael and he had better stop dragging his feet. He got out of bed and he looked upon himself He realized that what he had experienced was more than just a vision, but the pain that he now felt in his head was real. The mark was left behind on his own, on his own forehead. And the headache that accompanied with that touch from the angel, it would last for all the rest of his life. He would always be reminded of his visit from St. Michael all his, every day 
with the pain in his forehead. What ultimately got to be known was that, that the finger of St. Michael had actually drilled a hole through his skull. We can know that because his relics, the skull of St. Aubert, has a perfect hole right in the forehead that can be seen to this day. <coughs> but St. Aubert, he understood the message clearly enough now and got after it and he converted most of the shepherds on that island actually and the very few that did not embrace the faith, well, they peacefully went their way to another location. And St. Aubert commissioned a church to be built, which ultimately became the church that would grow into what we now know as Mont Saint-Michel, off the coast of northern France. God uses angels to aid man in his life. He sends them out. They are his messengers. They come to do what is necessary to assist us in knowing and performing God's will, in being inspired to pursue after virtue, to help us and protect us against harm and against sin, to lead us in a pathway of sanctity and assist us on that way. We see the interaction of man and angels so many times. These bridges of the gap of heaven and earth. They come and we see it throughout the scriptures. When we see Raphael leaving Tobias and Sarah to be married together there. Or the angel carrying Habakkuk to bring food to Daniel in the lion's den. Or when Gabriel, of course, comes and makes his announcement to the Blessed Virgin Mary of the coming of the Messiahs. These and so many more times illustrate to us the effect of angels in the course of history. And we see a myriad more in the lives of the saints and throughout the things that are part of the traditions of our faith. And we understand that this is indeed reality but it is easy for us to look back and understand that a person from the scriptures truly interacted with an angel or saint had seen a heavenly being standing by their bed but we often forget that those same angels are around us every single day and that moreover each and every single one of us is given our own, a guardian angel, there to protect and to guide us in our own life. Their sole mission during the, our entire life upon this earth is to help us and bring us towards God. We forget about that reality and forget to realize just how much heavenly assistance we have readily by our side to come and assist us in a moment should we reach out and call upon them to remember that there is a saint that we cannot see who intercedes on our behalf who prays to God for us who looks out for our well-being and who inspires us to do what is necessary for that growth but we seldom look to listen to hear that inspiration because we sometimes confused about how we find it. Like Saint Aubert, we are not sure how to know how God is inspired to send a message to us by another. And to us it doesn't come in the middle of the night in a vision standing by our bed. And we certainly hope it isn't going to require a hole being drilled in our skulls. However, where we can find God's message to us, his will for us, and that good aid in perfection, is in times of that quiet reflection. When we have prayed and asked our guardian angel to help us in a situation, and then to find ourselves in the quiet, realizing the inspiration, 
manifest themselves in various ways. At times it takes on the form of our conscience, in which it is pricked at times and warns us to avoid something that could be dangerous to our souls. It tells us that perhaps there are certain things in life that are too often the cause of our fall and that these things should be avoided and purged away. It comes to us in the way of inspiration, the recurring thought in our minds in which we, by making good reflections, realize that we have attachments in this life, attachments that perhaps keep us from ascending to the heights of perfection that we are meant to go to. They control us and they influence us more than we care to admit very easily. The influence of the angel comes to us at times by inspiration of looking where we can do more in the way of prayers, in the way of learning about our faith, in the way of finding opportunities to practice virtue, in the way in which we can spend our time more devoted to, the, to loving and serving God, the ways of piety that help draw us in that pathway to heaven. The things that come from angels oftentimes are the things that we recognize to be good, but we hesitate to exercise because it requires certain changes on our part. And we drag our feet and we hesitate and we're not sure if this is really what we're meant to do. But if we are taking that time to reflect, if we are prayerful and asking for to be led, and if we do realize that little bit of effort, that little bit of change, that little pricking of ourselves by mortification, that these things are part of God's will and help us in the way of perfection, then our angel has us by the hand and he leads us onwards down that path. And in the end, if we persevere in continuing to take one step after another along that way, our angel will rejoice because his job will be completed and he will have succeeded and he will have brought us, the creatures of earth, to join him in the choir of heaven for all of eternity. May God bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.
under thy command, they may seek out all evil spirits, engage them everywhere in battle, curb their insolence, and hurl them back into the pit of hell. Who is like unto God? O oh, good and tender mother, thou shalt ever be our hope and the object of our love. O oh, mother of God, send forth the angels, the holy angels, to defend me and drive far from me the cruel foe. Holy angels and archangels, defend us and keep us. Amen. Saint Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. We are the guardians of the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke you and come on your way. And to now, Prince, the heavenly host, by the power of God, cast in hell, Satan, and all evil spirits, who wander all the world, seeking the souls of the dead. Prayer to the guardian angel. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom has love admits me here, ever this day and at my side, to light, to guard, to rule, to guide, from sinful stain, O keep me free, and in that sorrow I will be. Amen. O Sacred Heart of Jesus, Holy John of Jesus, Doctor of the Sick, our Lady of Consolation, Mother of Good Counsel, Immaculate Heart of Mary, Heart of Saint Joseph, Saint Michael the Archangel, may the divine assistance remain always with us. Amen. 